Why is this happening? What is going on? How you were one of the masterminds behind the pandemic along Bill Gates and the Illuminati. It's not that somebody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I have a choice. Do I want to believe in a benevolent God or do I want to believe that Bill Gates is trying to put G5 chips in my kid? The issue of misinformation is deeper, more complex, more challenging. It's actually, I think, one of the biggest problems of our time. Professor Dan Ariely is a world-renowned expert in behavioral economics and psychology, and we're thrilled to have him on today's podcast. With a PhD in cognitive psychology and a doctorate in business administration, Dan has authored best-selling books like Predictably Irrational. His groundbreaking research reveals surprising forces behind our decisions, influencing both academia and real-world applications. What is it about the human mind that is so susceptible? And what are the forces that take us and can take us down this funnel of misbelief in leading us to believe in things that are not good for us and not good for society? The main antidote to stress is resilience. So we are high stress, low resilience. And those are the conditions that are, that are creating stress. This is crazy. So my question is, are we going to see raise in more rational people believing in misinformation? Misinformation that is tailored for each individual specific. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Professor O'Reilly, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I want to start the conversation about how you were one of the masterminds behind the pandemic along Bill Gates and the Illuminati. Of course, yes. I'm only kidding. And for our viewers here, this is a very good foundation over here to start our episode. First of all, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Dan is a professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke University, and his latest book, Misbelief, digs into why, or rather what, makes rational people believe irrational things. So, Professor, I'm very excited to have this conversation and really dig into this, especially in today's climate. I think this is a very important conversation. So first, I have to ask you to share the story of how you ended up in this conspiracy story regarding playing a role in the pandemic and the new world order. Yeah. So um, roll back the time, early pandemic time, beginning of 2020, and as a social scientist, I find myself uh, working day and night on pandemic-related questions. Uh, how do we do distant education? How do we do remote work? What do we do with getting people to wear masks and be careful? What do we do with domestic violence, releasing prisoners? I mean, just the, the number of topics were incredible. Anyway, I do this day and night, day and night for a while. And then at some point, I get an email from somebody I once helped. And she said, Dan, what's wrong with you? How will you become this person? And I say, what do you mean? I, I respond in my email. I said, what do you mean? And I get a long list of links. I'll just describe one of them. That link, it shows pictures of when I was badly injured, when I was about 18. It's true. Burned in most of my body, true. That's why I don't have hair on this side of my body. It's all scars. And... Um, uh, it says how I spent almost three years in hospital, also true. But then it went ahead to say how, because of that, I started hating healthy people. And 
joined Bill Gates and the Illuminati to try and kill as many people as possible, first with the pandemic and then with the vaccine. Not true. By the way. <laughs> um, and I spent about a month trying to fight this misinformation. It's very painful to be so, so attacked. Um, and then I failed miserably. And I turned to try to understand that phenomena. And, and I learned a lot in the next two years, and that's, that's my book, Misbelief, is about my journey to try and understand this phenomenon. And I would just say that at the end of the day, I've learned, first of all, that these misbeliefs are not for nothing. Mm -hmm. People adopt them to fulfill some deep psychological need. It's not that somebody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I have a choice. Do I want to believe in a benevolent God or do I want to believe that Bill Gates is trying to put G5 chips in my kid and get them to be non-fertile. Nobody would choose that, but it, it, it answers a deep psychological need that people have and will go into it. But the second thing I realized is that the problem is much bigger than I thought. That the issue of misinformation is deeper, more mm -hmm. complex, more challenging. And it's actually, I think, one of the biggest problems of our time. If you look at all of the challenges society is facing, unless we solve the problem of misbelief and misinformation, I don't think we will be able to make any progress on any of the other topics. So uh, that's the that's the story. And on on the personal level, I would invite the people who are listening to to think about the following question: Do you have somebody in your life, somebody that five six years ago? You looked at them and you said to yourself, me and that other person, we see life in the same way. We have the same opinion. We process information the same way. We interpret things in the same way. And now you look at the same person and you say, something is wrong with them. Something about the way they process information, about how they, how can we both look at the same reality and interpret it so, so differently? And if you have these people in your lives, and most of us do, then this book is really about trying to understand what is the process that happened. It's not that they are something is broken. It's not that they're wrong. It's also not about them. It's about what is it about the human mind that is so susceptible and what are the forces that take us and can take us down this funnel of misbelief and leading us to believe in things that are not good for us and not good for society. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. Well, we're going to get uh, much more deeper into that. But when I was taking a, over, uh, a look at your book, the first one of the first things that stood out to me was that you mentioned that misinformation appeals to something innate in all of us. Can you elaborate on that? Are you saying that we have or I have an internal desire to seek out misinformation as well as spread information? What is going on? Yes. Yeah. So, so basically, this is a reaction to stress. So imagine that we're stressed. And I don't mean the kind of stress that you say, oh, my goodness, I'm so busy. I have lots of meetings today. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the kind of stress that you say, I don't understand the world. I don't understand why I don't have a better job. I don't understand why my spouse is sick. I don't understand why I didn't get this promotion and somebody else understood that. I don't understand why. Lots of things, right? And it could be COVID when we don't understand things. It could be that we don't understand what Iran and Russia and Ukraine are doing or what the Houthis are, are about. It could be that I don't understand what this new AI world is going to be like and will my job still be around in three years. And when we, when we have this uncertainty and lack of clarity, we look for a story mm. because the story eventually gives us a sense of control. It doesn't have to be the right story, but it's a story. So here's an example. Imagine that you have two tribes. 
one tribe is fishing in a lake and one is fishing in a deep ocean. Which one of them has a more predictable environment? The lake. The lake. It's kind of right. the same thing day after day. The ocean, very different. Storms, currents, all kinds of things. Which of these two tribes do you think develop more superstitions? The one in the deep ocean. The deep ocean is kind of our approach, our attempt to feel that we're in control. By the way, in baseball, with the lots of superstitions, you can see that the number of superstitions actually vary is the level of unpredictability depending on the position somebody is having. So when we're in stress and the world is unpredictable, we look for a story. And not all stories are made alike. What are particularly good stories? Stories with the villain. And that helps us feel that we understand the world and it's somebody else's fault. And then in a short time, that really helps. We feel 100%. much better. Of course, in the long term, if you start looking online and you find more and more videos about all of those things, it gets things worse and worse. By the way, I think that I also partially got into this uh, because of my strange half a beard, right? Because I think I think this, uh, you know, anybody who is injured looks different, but this half a beard, I think, is kind of a, you know, they call me the half a bearded professors. They would they would professor. They would say, "We're sorry, your other side did not was not burned um, as well." But they, they said I look like the devil. You know, there was all. I think the the, the strange look that I have. I think also added, like, each picture of me became a clickbait. Mm. <laughs> and partially, I think it's this strange look I have. So uh, that also added added something. But in any case, the, the building block is stress. The building block is stress. And I want to say something else, and I think as an educator, you would appreciate it, that the, um, the main antidote to stress is resilience. Of course, the main idea of the stress is not to feel stress, but imagine that there is stress, right? There's illness, there's pandemic, economics, AI, all kinds of stuff. What, what helps us deal with this stress is resilience. And we are actually at a very low time of resilience. As a, as a, uh, as a community. As a community, as a society, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that our social relationships are frail. Not just because of COVID, but we spend more and more time with our nuclear family, less and less time with friends. Uh, work used to be a place where we developed friendship. Now most workplaces are saying, don't talk about personal things. Don't talk about romantic things. Don't talk about politics. So we end up having work friends that are not real friends. And economic inequality is also adding to lack of resilience. Because even at the level of a neighborhood, if you have increased economic inequality, you're less likely to ask your neighbors for help. Right. And, and you know, my, my favorite uh, terms of resilience is this thing called secure attachment. And I'm guessing you, you covered that in, in, in some of the episodes because Wait, it's such an yes. important topic in, in child development. But secure attachment, I think the best uh, kind of thought experiment is the following. You're a parent to a four-year-old kid. You go with them to the park. You say, kid, go to the swing. The kid goes to the swing and comes back an hour later. If that's what happened, you've been successful. You have a kid with secure attachment. On the other hand, if you say to the kid, go to the swing, and every 90 seconds they look behind your shoulder to make sure you're still there, not so successful. And this idea of resilience, basically saying that resilience is partially knowing that if we would fall, somebody would be there. The kid mm -hmm. that has to check all the time is not sure that you will be there. But imagine walking around life, knowing that somebody will catch you. So when we have little kids, hopefully their parents are doing it. But who is doing it for us? Who is doing it for us at, at our age? And we want our friends to do it, our significant other, our families, right? So, so the people who have our, our government, uh, social services, right? We want to know, we want to walk around life with this insurance belief. Yeah. If something bad will happen, somebody will catch us. And we have less and less of that. 
yeah. for all of the reasons we, we said. We have less trust in the government, less time with friends, and more economic inequality. So, so we're high stress, low resilience. And those are the conditions that are, that are creating stress. Now, let's look, for example, at recent event on colleges, mm-hmm. right, with the, the, the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza and the protest. There are lots of ways to look at this. There are lots of ways to look at it. But, but one way to look at it is to say that here is a group of people with very low level of resilience, very low level of social identity. They're kind of frail. And, and they basically join something that gives them a sense of meaning. It could have been something else. Right? But, but uh, people, people uh, have been saying, oh, you know, these young college kids are saying from the river to the sea, and many of them don't know which river, and many of them don't know which sea. They've not taken a single history lesson about the Middle East. And, you know, people, people come down on these uh, college students. But the reality is that we need to understand that they are not living in an easy environment. And, and that's what I said, that these misbeliefs are not for nothing. Mm. Uh, they they feel a hole in something, and I think college students these days there is a I I look at it also as a cry for help. I think there is something very deep that is missing in in them, and, and they found this one way to to deal with it, not exactly ideal and so on, but it tells you about I think a bigger a bigger problem that they're suffering. From. And so that bigger problem, I assume, stems really from the environment, as you're saying, high stress environment. But maybe the government high, today high is not doing a good. Always going to be there. It's not going. Well, to be no. Scared. Well, we're not talking about stress from college or I mean regular kind of stress, but uncertainty. Yes, sir. You know, AI displacing jobs. That's right. The, the stress from college is not a problem. Like the stress, you know, we, we have these two types of stress. There's predictable stress. I have lots of homework. I have lots of this. Yes, it's stressful, but I know what I need to do. Even if I can't do it, I know what I have to do. Okay, and I have to not work on this project and work on this project. I'll get B here. I'll get an A here. That's not the, the stress I'm talking about. The stress I'm talking about is the stress when you say, I don't understand the world. The stress of uncertainty, right? The stress of, like, think about Job from the Bible. Like, why is this happening? What is going on? Why? They always told me that my life will be better than my parents. And they only always told me if I only go to college, I'll have, have an easy time getting a job. They always told me that I'll have a good life moving forward. And now I say, what, what's going on here? Where, where is this going? Right. Right. But is it always been like this, or right now it's more? So I think I think two things are happening. One is there's always been some of it. I think COVID has been huge. I think we're not over COVID, by the way. You know, we uh, people say, okay, we're back at work. No, we're not back at work. I'll, if you want, I'll, I'll say something about that. So I think I think we have more stress. Um, just think about the the Ukraine Russia war. Uh, just think about what's happening in Israel and Gaza, what's happening with Iran. I think there's lots of stress, AI, political tension. I think with a very high stress, very low resilience. So I think it is, it is tough. Um, now, uh, will we get better? I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so that we'll, uh, we'll get better both in terms of the actual stress and in terms of resilience. So we have high stress, low resilience, and unbelievably um, complex world of information that tempts people to go down the funnel of me speaking. Well, what needs to happen? Because you, you mentioned that you're optimistic and I, I, I am also, I hope we all are, for that trend to change where the stress comes down, the resilience goes up. What needs to happen in our society for that, for, for that trend to change? So lots of things need to change, right? I wish I wish it was one thing. You know, when I started writing this book, I promised the publisher that I'll have a chapter on solutions. <laughs> At the end, I don't have a chapter on solutions. I have these little sections called hopefully helpful, 
which you know is things we each can do in our personal lives to help ourselves, to help people around us. But we also need some big steps, you know, in the same way that if we want to deal with the environment, there are things we can each do, you know, save energy, temperature, and so on. But eventually the government needs to do things as well. We can't just, each of us, if each of us did our part, it wouldn't be enough. It needs to be collective action. And the same things need to happen here. There are many solutions. We need many things, right? Uh, Media literacy will help a little bit, but we also need to change the way social media work. Mm. And we need to change our attitudes uh, towards misinformation and lying. Um, so so we, need, we, need, we need to change lots of things. We need to increase resilience. We need to reduce stress. We need to change uh, the nature of information out there. Uh, and my, my hope, by the way, is that uh, this problem is becoming sufficiently big that we will decide to deal with it. Mm. I have no doubt that if we if we decided this was a high priority problem, we could deal with it. Not perfectly, of course, and we couldn't solve everything. We could dramatically improve it, and um, it's more solvable than cancer. <laughs> I think it creates more damage than cancer these days, uh, and it's more solvable than cancer. But but we mm. need to. To decide to deal with it, and and that that I think is what we need to do next is and and until we solve that problem, I don't think we can make progress in almost anything else. Hmm. I mean, especially nowadays. I mean, this topic is very important. I mean, more important than it has ever been before. I would say, and I'm worrying about yep. the misinformation campaigns and how successful they can be. So with all with all these AI new tools, ChatGPT, Bard, this, that, we right now we can clone the voices, deep fakes, all this stuff. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah. So my question is, are we going to see raising more rational people believing in misinformation, or or no? Okay, so there's there's, there's lots to say. So first of all, and most people worry about AI and deep fake. And I think there's lots of reasons to worry about that. But I actually worry about um, misinformation that is tailored for each individual specific. Mm. So think about the cookie. The cookie is a weaponized food that somebody is designing to tempt us. It's an optimal combination of sugar, fat, salt, and crunchiness to get us to want one and another, another, another. Imagine that there was somebody who creates the right cookie for each of you at each moment. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. Right now, they're aiming for kind of an average taste, right? But what if they could understand your taste right now? Correct. And the next cookie you would take is kind of ex ideally designed for your current level of needs. So that's what I worry about misinformation, that I want you to believe in something and I understand something about your mindset right now. You're processing deeper, you're not. You had the fight with your significant other, not. You read something that gets you to believe more right, more left, more this. And I now tailor things in lightning speed. Right. You, you, ping, you ping a page and you get a, a modified version that is designed to ultimately convince you right now. It, it, it fits on every one of your weak points. It push all your weak buttons. That's... That's the version that frightens me the most because it will be the most convincing. You know, if you see, let's say if we'll have deep fake, let's say 50% of the information was deep fake. You would say, I'm not going to trust anything. But if something is going to start being tailored to you, you could make it so that it will be, have just that. The way conspiracies are built is they start with things you believe and then they add something. Mm. Nobody comes right. to you with something that is kind of completely out of your world. We start with Dan was injured, that was this, and then we move to Dan started hating healthy people and so on. So, so I, that's that's the thing, right? You want to, uh, I mean, not want to, but you know that that's how they're built, and that's what that's what frightens me. Now, um, let me say one kind of very different. You no. Know, 
we human beings, we are trusting. We're trusting. Like, you know, when I, when you read something, your first instinct is to trust. Now, why do we trust information? It's because in our evolutionary history, most of the information was worthwhile trusting. Hmm. Imagine we lived in a small community, 200 people. And if one person was caught lying to other people, there will be gossip about that person. And that person will be ousted by everybody. Now, if you think about lying to other people and say, hey, if they catch me, they'll, they'll gossip around me. Nobody will ever talk to me. Everybody behaves better. So then, if you think about it, gossip and uh, disappointment, angry, anger with people was the old version of the police force Mm. in the judicial system, right? Like, it was self-regulated. Right. Now, we need the judge, we need the police, you do something bad. But before that, the punishment was just the way people treated you. And gossip was the mechanism to make sure that everybody was, like, uh, enforcing that, right? So you, you did one thing badly. So we, ha- we have, everybody we have knows to blame bureaucracy right now, then. That's <laughs> And so... So... So because of that and some other reasons, uh, uh, evolutionary speaking, we grew up in an environment where we could trust the signals, right? Most of the things were correct for, for structural reasons. Right. Then we changed our environment. And now we have cheap talk and we have anonymity and we have different incentives. Nobody's holding anybody accountable. It's a new environment. And now we can't trust people anymore. But our instincts are still trusty, trustworthy. So you could say, let's try and do two things. One of two things. Let's either get people to stop trusting. That's what I promise. Trust nothing. I really don't like that. The other perspective, it's let's, let's make it so that the media platforms we have are worth trusting them. For me, that's a much better, that's a much better approach. So I think it will be very hard for us to overcome our nature uh, and also not desirable. Mm. I am grateful that we're trusting. I think it's a wonderful part yeah. of humanity. Irrational, but wonderful. Like we're <laughs> capable of love, we're capable of uh, gestures to other people, altruism, writing poetry, uh, we're trusting, we're reciprocating. All of these things are irrational, but wonderful. I don't think we should try and change people, I think we should try to change the systems that we have so they're worthy of, of our particular quirks. I don't know, but I, what I wonder at what age does this change happen and why irrational, uh, why rational people start to believe in irrational things? At what age does it happen? For example, uh, kids are different. I mean, they, I, I mean, I can just speak for my kids probably only <laughs> they they question everything whatever i say they don't believe me right away they yeah. start to question but at what age this worsens so so i don't know exactly the age but i'll, I'll say something in general about kids there's this metaphor and the kids walk around the world with that lanternier they walk around and the lanternier lights in all direction, but not very far. And this is why you walk with your kids to school and they see an ant and they forget about school and they're just interested in an ant. By the time you get to my age, you don't see the ant. The ant. And the metaphor is we, we switch our lanternier for a flashlight. The flashlight focuses your attention and you are just single-minded. And when you're single-minded, if you ask, why is nature doing this to us? Why do we get so focused on some things? It's to save energy. We don't want to look at everything all the time. We want to basically save energy, so we focus on one thing. And it's amazing. You could be in a busy room with lots of people, and you look at the person you talk to, and you don't hear anything from the background. Mm. Unless yeah. somebody says fire or sex or this, but but you know, in general, you you you, you can just focus and tune everything. Up. And the argument is that our mind is trying to conserve energy and conserve energy by just focus on on specific things. Mm. So if you if you look at this as a metaphor, 
I would say that this is also a metaphor for having beliefs that we don't question. It's very, very tiring to wake up in the morning and say, wow, make a list of all my beliefs. <laughs> Which religion do I believe in? And what's the type of government that I think is the right one? And what do I think is the right way to raise kids? And you know, all, let me question, like, it's, it's impossible, right? It's impossible. So what do we do? We create strong strong beliefs and we don't question them very much. In fact, we stop questioning them and we start looking at information that gets us to agree with them even more. You believe in on the right or political left of the US, you watch Fox News or NBC, right? You you choose to watch things that that, right, that um, resonate tell totally, you tell you yeah. back that you were that you are correct. And, and there is something called intellectual humility. And intellectual humility is about not being sure about anything. Right? You say, what is the right party to choose? I know, I think it's X, but I'm not sure. What is the right uh, way to raise kids? I think it's Y, but I'm not sure. Intellectual humility is kind of an incredible an incredible skill, and by the way, something I think we should educate our kids to, to enjoy the uncertainty. Because things become dangerous when you're 100% sure. Hmm. Think about the debate in the US about abortion. There are very few people who said, I think X, but I might be wrong. Instead, what we're trained to do is to say, I'm 100% sure in X, Correct. And if you believe not in X, you are either an idiot or you're broken or your your something is wrong with you. Right. right? We we but but teaching kids to have intellectual humility and and to maintain it through adulthood. But it's tough, right? Walking around the world, being unsure has a cost. We like certainty. We like leaders that say this is the way. And and basically to say, I think it's the way. I wish it would. I wish it would be easy to teach your kids to have uncertainty. This is, I think, one of That's the right. hardest thing that I'm trying to teach my kids. Because I mean, as you said, everybody likes plan. Everybody likes to follow their structure, day this and that. And as soon as something changes, I mean, our brain is just shuts off and we don't know what to do. But you, yeah. were, you were, and you know, even even when we even when we do a Google search on something. We don't pay attention, but we usually search in the direction of our hypothesis. Correct. <laughs> and um, what Correct. are the side effects of chemotherapy? Right. We we don't uh, we don't say the op the the other thing. Right. What are the so so we we usually check or uh, what are the terrible things that Party X has done or how have Party X lied? Like we don't. We don't do the, the, the alternative. We don't ask, is there more evidence for X than Y? Right. We basically do confirmation bias all the time and we like it. But but I think that teaching ourselves about this, um, by the way, this is also a problem in, in medicine. You have a doctor who is being called in an emergency to the side of a patient and they create a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And what you would want to do is for them to create two hypotheses. It could be X or it could be, but the moment they create one hypothesis, now they mm. test X, but if it's not X, we've just lost a lot of time. Uh, in almost everything we do, it's a better process to create multiple hypotheses and to judge between them rather than create one hypothesis and to try and, and satisfy it. But it's a, um, we're working against, against our busy nature and against the mental load of doing that especially doctors nowadays they have to see so many patients the administration is i mean that's a whole another level of issues but yeah sorry yeah. what were you saying yeah i wanted to talk about you were saying that we don't need to change people we need to change system but isn't system starts with people what i mean what strategies can be there to change the system yeah so so system system uh, start with people but in particular moments so so think about the phone 
Phone is a system. Um, I don't think you can change people, the way people manage their attention. But I think you can change the way that notifications happen. Mm. So on my phone, for example, all the notifications are off. You know, when they, with when new apps show up, they, they always want to have notification and have notification, have notification. Now, if right now I would talk to you and there would be a notification, it would be very hard for me not to look. Like that would be changing human nature. Right. Have a notification <laughs> and don't look. And even if I don't look, it will be really hard for me not to think about what it is. Imagine I look at you <laughs> and there's a notification and I'm not looking. But I right. keep on thinking, oh, it must be really important. <laughs> oh, it right. must be amazing. <laughs> so, 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 you know, can we have notification and not look at them? No. Or, I don't know, spelling errors. Very hard for, to get people to type one page without spelling mistakes. Hmm. Can we change human nature and get people to type better? Very hard. Can we get spell checkers? out there and even more advanced spell checkers and so on. The answer is yes. So I, I think that it's all about designing systems that help us overcome our nature. You know, can we read a piece of information and always think to ourselves, oh, is this true or not true? Very hard. Right. But if we, before we like something, we have to say, like, imagine you click the like button and it says, are you sure it's true or not so sure? Let us know. Now, would you think about it naturally? Probably not. But if it was part of the system, you would say, maybe yes, maybe not. There's actually a very nice paper showing that just getting people to think about this more carefully, mm. people spread, people can tell some of the things and, and spread less misinformation. Mm. You know, right now, when they see something strange and I, and I spread it, I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying it's bizarre. I'm saying it's interesting. You know, you don't know what it is. But if I have to also make a judgment, um, am I sure it's true or not? That would make things very different. So systems are the way to get us to, like, our mind is not designed for the modern environment. You know, so what we need is tools. Hmm. I, before before we jump into the next question, I wanted to mention this before I forget. You mentioned earlier on that you you wanted to state something about COVID that you said we are not done with COVID. Can you please elaborate on that? Because uh, we yeah. seem to be uh, in uh, a, a an environment now where COVID is a thing of the past. Uh, so uh, please. So so I'll start with a little story. So when I was in the hospital, I was fed by a tube. 30 eggs a day and 7,000 calories a day to try and rebuild wow. tissue. About four months into my injury, they come to me one day and they say, the day after tomorrow we're taking the tube out, you'll start eating by yourself. And what do you think was my reaction? I said, please keep the tube in. I said, who needs to eat? What a waste of human activity. Who wants to chew? Why, why, why the point? And I, I thought that, like, I thought, I've discovered the future. <laughs> I have seen the future. In the future, nobody would eat, nobody, like, why would you take our time and, and spend it on this useless activity? Um, I thought, you know, nobody would go with a Jew in their nose, but I thought people would take pills or something much more efficient. Anyway, of course, they were the doctors, I was the patient. They told me what to do. I just did what they told me. And, and, and I started eating, and of course, I remembered how good food tastes. And it turns out that four months are enough to forget the taste of food. Like, mm. if you ask me, does food has taste, I would say yes. But I couldn't actually, I didn't really miss it. I, I mm. just lost it. So why, why am I telling you this story? After two years of being working remotely, some people are back at work. But are they really back at work? Pre-COVID, we had friends at work. We had people we cared about. Much of our caring for work was caring for people. And we had people we went out. We had people we 
uh, trusted, all kind of things like that. And then we had uh, two years of breaking social connections. Meetings were efficient. They started on time, ended on time. Nobody told a joke. Nobody shared anything personal. It was very efficient. A lot of people think we're back at work. But are we really back at work? And I think we're not yet back at work because we have not really fixed the social fabric that was broken. Mm. Yes, we're physically at work. But do we care about the people that we work with like we did in 2019, I think the answer is no. I agree we, we with you. We have lost something very important in that. So if we go back to resilience, and friendship, and people you can count on, and so on, I think we have much less in that. I think we're very functional. In fact, you know, when I, when I thought about food, I was thinking functional. Who needs to chew? Mm -hmm. In the same way, you could say, who needs to chit chat? Right. Who needs to tell right. jokes? Right. We need to tell jokes. We we enjoy looking into the eyes. We enjoy the little thing, the wrinkle in the eye when people smile. And we enjoy the little pieces of gossip and the, the shared experience. We want to know who else has kids in the same age and who is dealing with ailing parents. And if I need something uh, from the library, who can help me? I mean, all of those things we, we have lost. And I think companies need to put extra effort because, you know, just putting people back in an office, right. everybody's zooming from the office instead of zooming from home is not, is not the solution. This is right. not what we call back at work. No, this... that's a long, long answer. No, I absolutely agree with you. And I know we're running short on time. So I'm thinking what uh, questions I should ask you here. So I have a gr great question and I'm going to ask you to give the shortened version, I suppose, so I can get some through some of these questions. But Vlad, I think you're going to get a great laugh about the story. Professor O'Reilly, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about bureaucracy. I want you to share the story about your $5,000 sofa because this is great because we work with a lot of, uh, we're a state approved vendor for many school districts across all 50 states. So this is, this is we're going to get a kick out of this and uh, so will the audience. So please uh, tell us about the very expensive sofa that you tried not to get. Yes, so uh, so I, I, I have this new website called the Center for Advanced Bureaucracy where I, I make fun of bureaucracy. Uh, but so, so I was at MIT at the time and I walk by a hardware store and there's a little velvet sofa, two seater. And it's $158 if I remember correctly. And I buy that little velvet sofa and they bring it to my office and I submit the receipt uh, to be to pay me back from my own uh, expense account. My own, every, every faculty has a, an expense account. And I get uh, an email that my request was denied because it's not an approved vendor. <laughs> so I say, please give me the list of approved vendors and I get catalogs and catalogs of approved vendors. And I don't want an approved vendor. I like this little cheap sofa. Uh, so I asked the question of above what price does the dean have to sign that this is approved? And they say above $5,000. So I find this red velvet sofa made by a French designer that is about $5,000. And I ask to buy that one. And I fully expect to get a call from the dean and say, Dan, are you out of your mind? Are you sure you want to spend $5,000 on a little red sofa? And I would say, no, 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 I don't want $5,000. I just want $158 <laughs> return. Anyway, I submit the request. I call in the afternoon and just say, hey, you know, when should I expect the call from the dean? And they said, no, he approved it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, like, okay, here is something like everybody lost. <laughs> who, who wants this expensive stuff? It's just like the moment you do things by the rules, it would be completely senseless. Yeah. But we just make it, make it work. And I'm not an education expert, but I think in education, a lot of the system look to me like they are designed, they are created for control. They are command and control. They look like 
you know, in the same way that in hospitals, the, the, the patient medical system is actually a billing system. It just yeah. called, <laughs> I think, I think in education, even the things that we think of as, you know, helping teachers and helping students and so on eventually are mostly designed as, as command and control. And when people are in a system that is mostly about command and control, uh, there's just not that much motivation. And with that being said, what advice would you give to CEOs or leaders of private companies when it comes to helping them cut down the layers of bureaucracy? Because I know a lot of companies, some leaders are fantastic. They have very little bureaucracy. Other companies, oh man, layers and layers and layers. So what advice would you give them to, to, okay, to convince so them all, to cut this down? So first of all, I want to say that I do understand the desire for bureaucracy. Uh, like all of us, I have also been betrayed by people. You trust people, you create a system with low bureaucracy, low checks and balances, and then from time to time, somebody will betray your trust. And when somebody betrays your trust, the, the first instinct is to say, I never want to experience this again. From now on, a lawyer. From now on, everything. Mm. From now on, I'm going to demand this. From now on. But but the reality is that when we're hurt, we never want to experience that again. But when we create bureaucracy, we eliminate also lots of good things. So, so you know, um, what would get people to be motivated? You know, let's say, let's say somebody cheated on their expense report when they went for lunch. And you say, oh, somebody, somebody exaggerated. Let's take an example. Somebody exaggerated uh, the number of days they were at work, and in fact, they took some days off when they didn't really, uh, they didn't really report it. And you say to yourself, "I never want people to take days off and take advantage of the system. So let me get people to check in and check out every day, and let me install a piece of software on their." computer that if they look away from the, the the screen for too long, I will know about it. Or if they stop uh, typing, I will deduct it from their paycheck because I never, never want to experience this again. So now you create a control system where people feel you don't trust them. Uh, what are the ramifications for that? Yes, you don't want to create these negative things, but because of that, you also reduce the upside. So the first thing I would say to everybody is to think very carefully about the cause and the pro. Hmm. You know, when, you, when you're creating a system, let's say we, we create a system where people check in and check out in a time card, punch in and punch out, what is the downside? Uh, and, and it turns out that when people feel not trusted, their motivation goes down. So you can say, okay, maybe I'm eliminating one person a year from abusing me on on vacation day, but I'm cutting all the top performance. Correct. The people who are really excited about what to do are now saying, okay, they don't trust me. I'm just not that interested in putting effort above and beyond. So so I think I think we need to be very clear about what are we losing when we adding bureaucracy, what we call the pain of bureaucracy. Um, and and if people say, oh, you know, I've, I've considered the costs and I considered the benefits and I decided it was worth it, that's fine. Right. I think in most cases, people don't see the negatives that he does. In fact, human, human motivation is incredible. You know, if, you, if we think about teachers, teachers became teachers, not because they thought this is the way to maximize lifetime income. <laughs> it's it's because they had the mission. Correct. And, and if we are doing things to get them to feel that they're unappreciated and they're not trusted, um, their mission goes down. I absolutely what agree we, with you. What are we losing? What are we losing by that? So, um, the, and, and it's not easy to measure. The things we're losing are not easy to measure, but they're very, very important. Yeah. Uh, Vlad, I'll I pass like it to, to you to ask the last question. Yeah, I'd like to end our uh, discussion with our tradition that we always ask our guests 
what question would you like to ask our next podcast guest guest but before that i would like you to answer the question that our last guest left for you which is okay what is the value you find at gratitude okay so so i've done actually lots of experiments on on gratitude and it turns out that even even at intel the chip manufacturer and a financial bonus to people who work making chips computer chips was not as effective as a thank you from their boss hmm. the financial incentives are okay at the moment that they were given but they the effect died very quickly whereas gratitude stayed in fact i've been i've been following the the performance of the fortune 500 in terms of how they treat their employees and how the employees feel about the company and what does it mean in terms of stock market returns. And it turns out that one of the best thing you could do is to get people to feel appreciated. Feeling appreciated, like people do lots of efforts that is not in their contract. Correct. Just imagine mentoring somebody. Nobody has mentoring in their contract. People do lots of efforts outside of their obligation, takes time from their activity for things that they think are good for the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, being noticed, being appreciated is incredibly important. That's a beautiful answer. I, I, okay, now for me to ask questions for the next yeah. guest. Um, do, can I get a hint of who the guest is? Uh, just general, any question you want. You can ask any question. That's any any question. So I would ask the question of, in your mind, what is a secret uh, to romantic to 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 uh, amazing romantic love? That's a fantastic question, Professor Riley. It's been a wonderful conversation. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us, or please let us know where our listeners can find you online and any exciting projects that you have currently or are going to accomplish in the future? So, um, so I have a website. DanRiely.com, D-A-N-A-R-I-E-L-Y.com. Uh, there's also a podcast there where I spend a, a day with people with different injuries that I think have been thriving. Uh, and uh, I think there's lots of lessons for mm. resilience um, in, that, in that podcast. Um, lots of other projects. Um, but if I if I think about the the kind of thing I would like people to to think about is really this uh, questioning our own confidence uh, and being slightly more open to the fact that we might be wrong. I love That's that, beautiful. and we think. definitely need a lot more intellectual humility uh, for everybody. So, Professor, it's been an absolute pleasure. We look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you so much Thank you. for your time. Thank you.